We'll go ahead and pray. Thank you, Lord, for being so good to us. Help us now to look into your wondrous book and to understand it. We ask this through your son's name, Jesus Christ, for beside you there is not God. Amen. The Bible is the word of God, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. This is the thesis we're taking, uh, Micah 4, 2. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth out of Zion, of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, I put that map there to show how they've always been placed in a key position. Israel is in a very key position. They're there as a land bridge to three huge land masses. And of course, that's why they were put there, so that the nations, Israel would teach the nations, and the nations would come to worship God. They would come to see God at the temple, that house, the house of, uh, of, of, the, of, of, the, of God. But notice, so it's, that's the key place, that's the key thing, the temple. It was in a very key place in the world. And it says, many nations shall come to the mountain of the Lord to the house, and that is the temple. And the mountain is something that's strong and immovable. It never moves, it's, that was supposed to be like that. The mountain of the Lord, was, that was the temple immovable it was always going to be there and they would always learn god and uh but notice what it says of the god of jacob jacob the only way we know our god is is through the bible and the bible is a jewish book and to get to know God, you got to go through a story because God is within a context. That's, how, that's the only way you can get to know him. You get to know him how he treats Jacob. How he treats Jacob, you get to know him. It's all about God. The whole Bible is about him. And, and uh, uh, as we go through life, it, is, it behooves us to get to know him, get to know God. That's what it's all about. And so you get to know Jacob and you get to know his God. That's what it is. It's his God we want to get to know. So the law shall go forth out of Zion. This is the prophet. He's saying, he's foretelling. This is going to happen. The law is going to go forth of Zion. And Zion is another name for um, the hill of God or Jerusalem. But also I call to, to mind here or notice that th I'm bringing this old map from the Old Testament. We saw that last week, in fact, how, they were, how the land was parceled out to, to all the tribes. This is the way it was set up. And, it was, and it's no accident. It's, God, when you go into the book of Joshua, he'll tell you where all the boundaries are for all these tribes. Why would he do that? Because it's important. There's a reason for it. You'll get to learn a lot of things. Like we've already been, been learning why the land is divided. Because God is teaching us. But notice what happens. Now, we're now in the New Testament. It says, Now, in the fifth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Eturia, and of the region of the Tacla Trac Onites and Licinius Tatrach of Abilene. So it's changed everything. The land, or what used to be a theocracy, God was supposed to be ruling over this people. The land has changed. You're now in the New Testament and it's not. Look at the new boundaries now. Now, in the 15th year, in the reign, the reign of Tiberius Caesar, this is a new king. It's not a theocracy anymore, that's gone. And look at the way the land is now mapped. It's very different. The map has been broken up very different. And so this is a mess because God can use that. 
This is something totally different. And he tells you where all these people uh, were ruling. A tetrarch is a fourth part a ruler, a, a ruler of a fourth part of a country. So they divided this land. Pontius Pilate ruling most of Judea. Herod ruling Galilee. Uh, that's Antipas. And then uh, Philip ruling another portion. And then Licinius ruling another portion. This is what the land looks like at the time that Jesus comes. It's a mess. This is what it is. And then he says this, and Ananus, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest, the word of the Lord came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. You would expect the word of God to come to the high priest. Those are the mediators. A priest is the mediator between God and the people. Well, that's not how, that's not what happens. I mean, we're told here, the word of God came unto John, uh, to, and, and, and uh, the son of Zacharias. Zacharias, again, we're reminded, God remembers. Remember, no matter what, no matter what a mess this is, it's like God doesn't get let go of his people. And that is so comforting for us. Because God doesn't, once you're a Christian, God doesn't let you go. I mean, you belong to him. And he's going to work you over. Whatever it needs to be done, he's going to work you over if you belong to him. So here you have, um, he says, and, and notice they have a temple. The temple is still there. But notice who renovated it, who, in, who enlarged it. It was Herod. Herod is a picture of the flesh. This tells you that this is all flesh. You can look good. You can come to church. I mean, every Sunday, go to church, whatever. But you still, the temple of God is still messed up. The flesh is ruling. This is what it's telling us. And, and it came to John, because God is gracious. That's what it says. His name means Yahweh is gracious. That's how the, the word continues to come. And it came to the wilderness. We're told the wilderness is a wasteland. That's what this is. It's a waste. And this is where John is, the word of God is going to come to the waste. And so I say, if you want to, like I showed you, the land of God can stand for a body in the Old Testament. And it can stand for a body in the New Testament as well. It's just that this is all under the flesh. It's not a theocracy anymore. And I look at Pontius Pilate as a conscience. Remember what he said when Jesus was standing right before him? He said, what is truth? And that's the conscience. The conscience is always dealing with truth. But the truth has got to be, you learn it. Uh, you can have an infirm conscience, you can have a weak conscience, you can have a corrupt conscience. And if you had a good mom and dad, you can have a pretty good conscience if they worked you behind. Because my mom did that to me. I mean, I knew that if I did certain things, she would work me over. And so I, I learned pretty soon what was right and what was wrong, according to her. So here you have the flesh being ruled by the conscience, and that's, the, that's a fleshly person. Okay, now look at this. Herod, I thought I'd show you, this is some picture of a model. I took that picture in 1998. When they, he, had, uh, he had palaces all over the land. He had several palaces. Um, so that again tells you that Herod, <clears throat> Herod was the one that was ruling the land. Uh, it was being governed by Pontius. But he had, that's the one in, in um, Jerusalem, and here's another picture. I took this of the ruins up in Caesarea Philippi. I was up there, and at the time when I went, I had a camera and only took 40 rolls, of, and so I didn't want to, I was being very uh, careful what pictures I took of. I, I should have taken a lot more pictures, but I says, nope, I mean, I, this is, was at the beginning of my trip. I says, I only have 40 rolls, and I don't want to waste them, and so, there wasn't much there at the time that I thought, so I took a picture of this picture of, of his ruins. And the only reason I took this picture was because there was a lizard there. I says, look at this. 
Pontius, I mean, Herod's palace is here, and the only thing that's here, it's, it's a lizard. Ah, I was making light of it. So, and, uh, but this is what this is. Notice the word of the Lord came, and that word there, the word is rhema, not logos. Logos is for the entire word of God. But rhema is specifics. When you get a specific word, that's what this means. He's going to have a, he's got a specific word and it came to John. And this is really what happens. Uh, the word of God, when the word of God comes to you, when we're, when we're not saved, we're, we're a piece of wasteland. That's what we are. We're wilderness. And the word of God comes and, and, and it comes to us when you could be in the middle of a fiesta or a party or a carnival, when the word of God comes to you, there could be so much noise everywhere and the word of God comes, quietly, softly comes and he does his work. And that's why it's coming here. He came to the wilderness to John without fanfare, small voice. And I think of me when I got saved, folks, I got saved in the middle of Houston. I mean, downtown Houston. I mean, on the hustle and bustle. And the voice of God comes and bam, I'm saved in the middle of all this that was going on. So now I need to give you a picture of this because John the Baptist is going to start preaching baptism. Okay, so what is baptism a picture of? I need to get into this a little bit. And what it is, is a picture of death to self. And we just had some baptisms last week. So I thought this was timely as well. Uh, death to self. And God told them in the Old Testament, they need, now the land, the way the land is situated, they were protected, very well protected. This piece of land was pretty well protected. They had the mountains of the Lebanese mountains to the north. To attack these people, you had to go, come through those mountains if you came through the north. Or if you were gonna attack through the south, it would be very difficult. That's desert. The Negev is on the south. And then you have the Mediterranean on the west. And on the east, you have the Arabian desert, but you also have this river, this boundary. So they were pretty much, well, uh, boxed in. And so they were told they needed to go, go in there, cross the Jordan River. And, and remember early on when uh, Moses sent 12 spies, they said, there's giants in there. They were afraid to go in, but God says, you need to go in. You need to go in there. And so it's a picture of dying to self. Um, look what it says here in Romans 7, 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. So if you stay outside, you're going to stay in bondage because the law does... It's, Unbending. I was just talking to a man yesterday concerning the law. Says the law doesn't care who you are. You can be Mexican, white, black, short, tall, fat, skinny, poor, rich. It don't matter who you are. The law demands that you obey it at all times. It that's who it is. It doesn't even care if you're dying of cancer. It doesn't care. A stop sign doesn't care. You stop. That's it. So the law is never unbending and it never dies. So if you stay outside, you're going to have to deal with the law all, as long as you live. And, it's, and it gives us an example of this in 7.2. It says, for the woman which has an husband is bound by law to her husband so long as he liveth. She's stuck with him. As long as he's alive, she's not free to marry another man. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So he gives us this example concerning the law. He says, look, the husband has to die in order for you to be free from that. And so if, if the husband dies, then you're free. From, you're loose from the law of her husband. And look what he says here. Wherefore, my brethren, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. The law cannot die. It's going to go on forever. Paul tells us it's the law. I mean, the law is going to go on. Uh, but So the, that means you're going to have to die. And in fact, it says here, 
you, you also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ. So that means that if Jesus died, and he died, 2,000 years ago Jesus died, and if you're in, in his body, if you died in him, he died. So if you're in him, he took your place. Vicariously, you died in him. I died 2,000 years ago. No, yes, I died. I was there 2,000 years ago when he was crucified. That was me. He took my place. So I died. So if he died and I was there, even, even to him who is raised from the dead, that means he, Christ, is alive. He rose up. I mean, we just celebrated that he arose. And when he arose, guess what? Ta-da! I arose. I'm alive. Wow. And that's what uh, brother, uh, uh, Pastor Ashton, when he baptized people last week, he took them under the water, they died, and when they come back up to newness of life, they're new. And that's what that means. It's a new way of thinking. You're now, you're walking in resurrected life. That's what it is. And that's what this teaches. So, what about the law? The law becomes a schoolmaster. It's telling you that as long as you stay outside, you're going to deal with the law. The law is going to work you over. And you want to be in bondage? And a lot of people are in bondage. They got to do certain things. Like I was just telling Miss Aaron, sometimes I don't feel like coming to church. Like going fishing or going off to the coast. But then I tell myself, you got to be there. Why? You're teaching. Oh, that's right. <laughs> So I can't take off to the coast, you know, but I mean, I wouldn't lose my salvation. I mean, but that's just the way it is. Um, so you're alive. Now look at this. So in baptism, we confess that we deserve to die. That's what you're doing. That's what you're saying. You die and then you rose up. So now John is coming to preach. This is what this is the rhema. This is the preaching that he's going to be doing. Look what it says. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins into this wasteland he came um, around Jordan. And so Jordan is that body of water or that river that flows from the north, from Sea of Galilee all the way to the Dead Sea. And so immediately you say, well, ha, there's water there. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking there's water. And so, but, in the Old Testament, it was used to go in there, go in there, and it's a picture. That's you're safer in there. You're boxed in that territory, that land that was boxed by the, those natural boundaries. But to us, it's crossing, going in there, and dying to self. That's what that body of water is. Now look at what John is preaching. He's preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And that word baptism means to emerge or submerge. And that's what happened to those people that were, uh, I was going to say buried last, last weekend or baptized last weekend. They, they were submerged or immersed. And uh, that's what that is, immersed. And, and to immerse means this, folks. Oh, and by the way, this is a mental attitude required for the forgiveness of sins. This is what he's preaching. And so you got to be really fine about this. Otherwise, you'll get off into thinking that water baptism is going to save you. And it doesn't. It's a mental attitude. So you're thinking, oh, we need water to be baptized. But this is a symbol. Water is a symbol that God, John is using. And we are using that as a symbol too. That body of water here behind me. It's a symbol. Um, of death. So to immerse is to involve oneself deeply in a particular activity or interest. That's what that is. And we have an example of that in the Old Testament. Look at this. 1 Corinthians 10, 2, Paul says this, and we're all baptized unto Moses in the cloud, in the sea, and in the sea. So most, the people are saying that all the Jews were baptized unto Moses. 
it explained into the law. Moses is the law. What, what does that mean? The Jewish people really love the law. And that's why they even dance with it like a woman. They dance with the Torah and they kiss it like they would a woman. Because they're baptized unto the law. They think that that's going to save them. It won't save them. Remember, the law is a schoolmaster. It's only there to teach you that you can't keep the law. I was talking to this man again yesterday. He was with a granddaughter. And I says, you can't keep the law, can you? He says, no, I guess I can't. I says, no, you can't. Nobody can. I says, in the old law, I mean, the Old Testament, we're given the law. But Jesus tells us that if you even think it, you've done it. I says, good. No. You can't keep it. Nobody can. And these people think they can. They think they can. And that's why they hold on to the law like this. But they were baptized unto it. It can't save them. You know. Uh, and John is preaching this. He teaching a, he's preaching a mental attitude. This is what he's doing. To immerse. And repent means to change the mind. You know, you change your mind. Your way of thinking. That's a change of thinking. That's what it is. The baptism of repentance. He says, I want you to immerse yourself into this kind of thinking. You're going to have to change your thinking. And that little word there, for. Change your way of thinking for the remission of sins. For the forgiveness of sins. This is what he's teaching. Change your way of thinking so that you can have repentance. Remit to forgive. So he's not teaching that this water is going to... He was teaching the people that this is a symbol. Because I'm preparing your mind for somebody that's coming. That's, that's John. This is what John is doing. And look what we're told here. We're told this in Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. That's it. The blood of Christ is the one that does it, not the water, it's the blood. And then he, we're told this, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without shedding of blood is no remission. That's what they were taught in the Old Testament. That's what all those sacrifices taught. You had to, you had to sacrifice those animals. They had to be blood, and we talk plenty of that in Leviticus. The blood on the horns. God had to see the blood. Although that blood didn't do it for you. Again, it was a symbol of a picture of the coming blood of Jesus. Because that was just the blood of bulls and goats. And that can't save you either. So they were saved on credit. The old people in the Old Testament. We are saved with, with the actual thing. You know, 2,000 years ago. Jesus died in the past. So this is what this is teaching. And look. Colossians 1.14. In whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins. There it is. There it is. That's it. Remission of sins. That's what does it. The blood, the baptism. And I remember a few years ago, there was a little boy sitting up front. He wanted to get baptized. And I, and I took him back into brother, brother pastor's uh, 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 office, his, his office. I took him back there and I talked to him. I said, why do you want to get baptized? Because pastor told me to take him and talk to him. And he says, because my mom's here. And this is the only time she can see me. I says, that's a wrong answer. You don't get baptized just because your mom's going to we'll see you. He says, no, you're not ready yet. He says, oh, okay. And that was it. But see, there's people that get baptized for the wrong reason. And you don't do that. Okay. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah, the prophet, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, there it is. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. And this is what he was, as, as Isaiah was teaching, Isaiah the prophet, that's what he was foretelling this was going to be done. He was going to be crying in the wilderness. Prepare. John the Baptist was going to prepare you unto the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So this was, to, this was to prepare you for what was coming. The way of the Lord. Make his path straight. So here it is. 
we have body and soul, and when the body and when the Spirit of God comes inside us, that's the important part. That's prepare the path for the Spirit to come in. So when the mind is prepared, after confession, and that's what these people last week were doing, they were, Pastor Ashton was asking them uh, to give a testimony of how they were saved, and then he baptized them. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that's the path. So you you already confess. You confess. You do the confession, and then you get baptized. Okay. So after confession, then you are immersed, and then. But see, he was teaching them that in order to prepare for this, for the Spirit to come in, because Jesus was coming with that baptism. He, John the Baptist, says, "I'm not doing it." I'm not putting the Spirit of God in you. I'm doing it with water. This is just a symbol. The way, the truth, the life. And by the way, all these things, the gate, the door, and the veil, folks, these are all, they all had, they were the, almost the, like the same fabric. It was the same colors, which pointed to Jesus. All the way, the truth, and the life, that's Jesus. The gate, the door, and the veil, it's all him. Nobody comes to the Father but by Him. He is the way, He is the truth, He is the life. He is the gate to the court, He is the door to the tabernacle, and He's the veil to the Holy of Holies. All the way through. That, that's the only way. Nobody can come to the Father but by Him. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And I had a hard time with this, folks. I said, it's got to mean something. I don't think I got it, but I'll tell you what I, I, I made of it. Because in Isaiah 7, 47 says, the grass, because the voice in the, as Isaiah was saying, there's a voice coming, make ye prepare the ways of the way of the Lord. And, and the voice says, what, what shall I say? Tell them this, the grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it, surely the people is grass. What that means, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's what I take it as. Okay? And so this, every valley shall be filled, humility exalted, every mountain and hill shall be brought low, pride abased, the crooked shall be made straight, hypocrisy exposed, and the rough ways meet shall be made smooth, justice meted. Everything is going to be put, and look at the word shall, shall, this is going to happen. And, and by the way, working in a paper, we could never use that word. You can't use it because the paper has no business in prophesying. We can only have news. We can't say tomorrow there's going to be an accident at 410 and 281, because they don't know that. So they can't say shall. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And I took that to mean all are without excuse. And this is what they, what's gonna be seen. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now notice there's a comma there where it says multi the multitude came to be, to be baptized of him, and then there's a comma. And that's important because he didn't call, John the Baptist didn't call them generation vipers. He didn't call them that. There was a specific group he called that. John the Baptist was fearless. And, look, and we're told in Matthew 12, 31, whither of them twain did the will of his father, they said unto him, the first, Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that the publicans go in, in and the harlots into the kingdom of God before you. So the, that's who went out to John the Baptist. The harlots and the publicans. These lowly people. But they saw John, this very rough character that came out of the woodwork. You know what I mean? I mean, looking all disheveled, his hair, eating grasshoppers and stuff. And they weren't, uh, they humbled themselves to this character. The Pharisees and the, and the Sadducees, they didn't. This is, 
who is this guy? They came to see him out of curiosity. Um, so, O generation of vipers, these are the people we're told. Look what it, we're told here in Matthew 3, 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees come to the bapt his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So he called them that, not the regular people. The regular people, they, they humbled themselves. And they wouldn't humble themselves. That was pride. Bring forth, therefore, fruits worthy of repentance, and, bring, and begin not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham to our father. Uh, so he's saying, bring forth fruits worthy of repentance. Be real. And these people were not real. They were not, right? They, these were, and he calls them that. He, 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 the Lord, a lot of people paint the Lord like he was, you know, mamby-pamby, kind of, you know, soft, you know. He was a rough character. The Lord was a rough character. He was a carpenter, and carpenters have rough hands. They, they, you know, you don't mess around with carpenters. They're, they're built, you know. Um, we have Abraham to our father. They were relying on the flesh. This is, you know, we look pretty good. We come to church every Sunday. We wear a coat and tie, you know. We tithe. We're okay. No, that's fleshy. That's fleshy. Um, they answered him, we, have, we be Abraham's seed. We were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, he shall be made free? So that was hypocrisy, and he called them out for that. Many times, the Lord called these people out, hypocrites. He called them hypocrites. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. He says, God can take, I mean, that's kind of funny, because I thought, you know, he's calling them rocks, and they didn't catch it. <laughs> but thick as bricks. And now the, also the ax is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree therefore which bringeth forth, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewed down and cast into the fire and the people ask him, what shall we do? This was, this was a rough sermon. He was telling them, hell fire is coming, that's it. I mean, these trees are gonna be cut down. So that's, he was just as going to be meted out. He's, he, he's pronouncing judgment. That's what John the Baptist is saying. He was one rough cookie. And Jesus said, For judgment am I, am I, am I come unto this world, that, that they which see not might see, and that they which see, see might be made blind. And this was right after, this verse here is right after he gave sight to a blind man born blind. Remember that? He made some clay with a spittle and then he put it on the eyes and, and he told them to go, go wash in the pool of Siloam and the man came seeing and the man says, hey, I was blind and now I see. And the Pharisees say, said, give praise to God. This man is a sinner. He says, I don't know. You guys want to be his disciple too? Oh, they were angry at him. Good night. And because they saw they perceived what was going on and yet they didn't want to believe it so jesus says okay you don't want to you don't want to see it so you are actually blind you are the blind so this is the judgment and uh what shall we and the people says what shall we do and he says this he answered and says unto them he that hath two coats let him impart to him that hath none and he that hath meat, let him do likewise. So it was simple. He says, to go back to the law of God. Uh, to love the Lord and your neighbor as thyself. Share, give. And I also look at the word coats there. And to me, that, that word garment, I always, every time I see garment in the Bible, it's like we're covered in the righteousness of Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And I can go through life pretty happy because I'm going to heaven. But that's mindless. If I don't share this good thing I have with others, you know, I need to share my garment with others. Um, my righteousness, which is not my own, is Jesus. And I thought I just... And then came also the publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he says unto them, Exact no more that that which is appointed unto you. So these, these people humble themselves. The publicans... They came to this rough character out there by uh, baptizing by the river. 
you know they humbled themselves. These are the, the guys that fared well. They did fare well and the, and the harlots too because they were going to go in before the public, before the Pharisees and the Sadducees were told. Humbling and confessing they came. What shall we do? Uh, they all wanted to do something. Exact no more than that which is appointed unto you. And then, and the soldiers likewise demanded of him saying, what shall we do? And he says unto them, do no do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. The same thing he was telling them, be kind, be loving. And the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts, saying, about John, whether he were the Christ or not. And they were asking him, he must be the Christ. This must be the Christ. And look what he says. John answered, saying unto them, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mighty than I comes, the lashet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There it is. He says, I am baptized you with a symbol. This is a symbol, cleansing of your thinking. But he who's coming, he is gonna change your way. I mean, completely. He's gonna change the structure. He's gonna change your nature. So that is baptism here. But notice, I need to close here quickly now, um, and, and whose fan is in, in his hand. And so this is, this is the judgment he is bringing. He will gather the wheat into his garner, and then the, and, and the shaft he will burn with fire unquenchable. That's the judgment. And this is how it closes. But Herod, the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all his, the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all that he shut up John in prison. This is not good. Of course, Herod, the flesh, he says, I'm not, I don't wanna hear it, I don't wanna hear it. He shut up, it says here, he shut up John. That's the voice. You shut up the voice of God, and that's the worst thing you can do. You shut up the voice of God, you shut up the Bible, and there's no remedy for you. You're done. And that's how that chapter closes. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your kindness and goodness towards us. Thank you for the teaching of the baptism, Lord. And we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for beside you there is not God. And we love you, Lord. Amen. Good, good.